Hey, my name is Meg Graham, and today I'm going to talk to you about the anatomy and physiology and the disorders of blood vessels. Um, we know that blood is carried in a closed system of vessels that begin and end with the heart. So if you have the heart here, the vessels that are, leave the heart or carry blood away from the heart are always going to be called arteries. So that is, by definition, an artery. It carries blood away from the heart. Don't get hung up on arteries carry oxygenated blood and veins carry deoxygenated blood because there are cases where that is not true, like in the pulmonary and fetal circulation. So the definition for an artery is it carries blood away from the heart. And then the definition for a vein would be that it carries blood towards the heart. So those are your set definitions. And then in between, you're going to have the capillary system, which connects the arterial and venous system. And the capillaries are where we have exchange of gases, nutrients, and waste at the tissue level. So the capillaries connect the two systems, and they're also the site of exchange for everything that the tissues are going to need. Um, notice just right away from this picture that veins and arteries appear quite differently. Veins are have this large collapsed lumen, and a lumen is just a space inside of, of, of a tube or an organ. It's just that empty space, and in this case, that's where the blood travels. But this large collapsed lumen in ve uh, veins tells you that they're under very little pressure, and so that's a, a, another sign of a vein. They are under low pressure, whereas arteries are going to have this nice rounded lumen and a big thick wall, and that tells you that they are under much greater pressure. And the reason they're under more pressure is because the arteries are getting that blood as it is pumped or pushed from the heart. So they are going to be under much more pressure. Whereas the veins um, are just trying to return the blood to the heart and they're not under as nearly as much pressure. Notice though that you have the thicker walls and we're going to talk about all the different types of vessels. Um, and there's a great composition uh, variety among the vessels and so we'll just have to go through each one and tell you about each one. But there is a common structure and we call that common structure tunics. Um, think of tunics as covering, like today. When I got up this morning, I put on my tunics. I started with the bra and panty layer. layer. <laughs> I said bra and panties on video. Um, then I went to the shirt layer, and then I've got a blazer on. So I have three tunics on, or three coverings on. Well, with blood vessels, you have a similar type structure. Um, you start with the tunica intima, which is, think, intimate. That's the most closely uh, the, this innermost layer. And so with the tunica intima, basically what you have is a, a cross-section of a vessel here, and you have a single layer of flattened endothelial cells. Now this is really designed so that you can have exchange of things across these uh, flat cells. Um, the, occasionally on a larger vessel, if the vessel is greater than one millimeter, um, you would have a sub-endothelial layer. So you would just call that the sub-endothelial layer. And I'm going to go ahead and flip to the next slide so that you can actually see these as we talk about them. So there's your endothelial layer right there in the tunica uh, intima on both the artery and the vein. And then these are larger vessels, so they show this tunica, uh, or excuse me, the sub-endothelial layer, which is part of that tunica intima as well. Then you go to the tunica media, that middle layer. And it's composed of smooth muscle and elastic fibers. You need the smooth muscle because you have a lot of vasoconstriction and vasodilation going on, and that smooth muscle is what controls that. Um, this is real important in the arterial system, not so much so in the venous system. So in the venous system, you're going to have a, a, a thinner, smaller tunica media. In the arterial system, it's going to be much larger. Um, it's, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the controls for these, but depending on what type of vessel it is, you're going to have a great variety. Um, in how much muscle versus how much elastin tissue are going to be present in each one. And of course you need the elastin tissue for, uh, to return things back to shape. So if you take a rubber band and you stretch it out, um, you don't want it to stay stretched out or it's going to be worthless. So you want it to recoil and go back to shape. So that's why you need the elastin in these vessels. Um, and again, this, this vasoconstriction and uh, vasodilation that's controlled by the smooth muscle that's going to be real important in controlling blood, blood, blood pressure, okay? Um, and then finally you have the tunica externa, or it's, it's also sometimes known as the tunica adventitia. Um, and this is the outermost layer, and it's composed mostly of connective tissue. Um, there, there's a lot of collagen in it, so those collagen fibers are right on the outside of these vessels. And this is there to protect and to reinforce and just to anchor 
these uh, vessels to uh, underlying uh, structures. Now, sometimes in this tunica externa, which is, you see that that's that outer, outer layer right here and right here, on a larger vessel, they're not going to be able to get the nutrients and supplies they need just from diffusion from the inside of the blood flowing through these vessels. So they're going to have to have their own blood supply. And we call that the vaso vasorum. And that literally translate out, translates out to be vessels of the vessels. So they have to have their own blood vessels to supply that outer tunica ad, uh, adventitia or externa. And then they sometimes go down into the tuni tunica media if it's a really large vessel. So just know that that vaso vasorum is found in the larger blood vessels and that's its own blood vessel supply. All right, let's see what we have next here. Let's just start going through the different types of arteries first. And the first arteries that you're going to come to off of the heart are going to be the elastic arteries. So these are going to be the arteries that are really feeling that pressure from the heart. And so they're going, that's going to be like the aorta, the pulmonary, the carotid, the subclavian arteries, all those vessels near the heart. They're going to be large, thick-walled arteries because they've got to withstand the pressure coming from that heart. Um, as it pumps and contracts, that's going to put a lot of pressure on these vessels and you want to make sure they don't um, blow up or you want to make sure that they're able to recoil and expand and contract as you need it. So all of these vessels are going to have lots of elastin in them. That's going to be a primary component of all of the elastic arteries, duh, the name elastic arteries. Um, and that's just to absorb this pressure from the heart contractions. With time though, this elastin starts wearing out. So as we age, you're going to start running into problems where this elastin starts wearing out and you get something known as arteriosclerosis. And we're going to talk more about this in a minute. Um, but that would just be from this elastin wearing down. Um, notice also that these vessels are going to have a large lumen, um, which is kind of uncharacteristic of most arteries. But that gives less resistance, so when that blood is pushed in there, they're not going to have as much resistance. Um, they, these vessels actually can act like as a pressure reservoir, so they can kind of ab absorb the pressure and expand and recoil as you need it as the blood is ejected from the heart. The next vessels that you're going to come to as you leave the heart are going to be the muscular arteries, and they're also known as the distributing arteries, and we say distributing because they distribute or carry blood. So they're the ones that actually deliver blood out to the body and all the different organs. Um, these are going to have a thick tunica media, and so they're going to have lots of smooth muscle. Sometimes you can have as much as 30, excuse me, 3 to 40 layers of smooth muscle in these vessels. Um, they're not going to have as much elastin because they're not under quite as much pressure as the vessels near the heart, but they do need more muscle because you're going to have a lot of contraction and expansion going on because these are very active in the vasoconstriction process. So when you need to raise the blood pressure in your body, so say some guy comes to the door with a machine gun, I'm going to want to get my blood pressure up and be ready to fight or flight. And so these are going to be really uh, important in vasoconstriction, so you need a lot of that uh, muscle, uh, those muscle layers to help with that vasoconstriction. Then as you keep moving away from the heart, you get down to the smaller um, arterial vessels, and these are known as arterioles. They're the smallest of the arterial system, and they contain six or less layers of smooth muscle and very little elastin, sometimes no elastin. Um, these are the ones that lead into the capillary beds. So they're really important in determining how much flow actually goes to the tissues or not. Um, these are uh, the vasoconstriction and the vasodilation and the flow to these capillary beds in these arteries is controlled by hormones or the sympathetic nervous system can cause vasoconstriction or whatever. Local chemicals can act on these, but these are the ones that determine how much flow is actually going to go into the, uh, the capillary systems. Then you get to the capillaries, and that's kind of that, that bridge between the arterial system and the venous system. Um, these are small vessels. They're microscopic. They're usually only large enough to let one red blood cell go through, so they're very tiny. Um, but these are important because they're at the site of where we actually exchange gases, nutrients, and waste. So they're mainly just composed of a tunica intima, and it's just this one cell layer of an endothelial cell. And notice that endothelial cells are nothing more than epithelial cells that are put on the inside. They're just that flattened squamous epithelium 
And so they allow for easy exchange of gases and nutrients and waste and things like that. Um, Ms. Nick is going to give you a whole lecture on capillaries because there's different kinds and they do different things. So I'm not going to say a whole lot more about those. Just remember though that capillaries are the site of gas exchange. That's a primary thing to remember. We need to get oxygen delivered to our tissues so that we can have cellular respiration to make ATP. Well, when we make ATP, we give off CO2 as a byproduct, and we don't want that building up in our systems, so we throw that out as waste, and we need to get that back to the lungs so we can expel it. So that's a primary role of the capillaries is to this gas exchange. All right, when you leave the capillary system, you then move into the venous system, and the smallest veins are called venules. Um, and that's just, these are vessels that are formed when the capillaries start uniting to form a larger vessel. vessel you call it a venule. I'll get it out. Blood flow in these vessels is very slow. And remember, we're going back up to the heart. And you actually have to have external forces that help push this blood back towards the heart. And we'll talk about those in another video. Um, notice, too, that walls of these vessels are very porous. So you can actually have uh, white blood cells, um, fluids, different things leaving the cap of these venules, similar to what you might have in capillaries. Uh, remember when white blood vessels, uh, when white blood cells squeeze out of vessels, what do we call that? It's diapodesis. Let me see if I spell it right. Diapodesis. I don't think I spelled that right, but it might be. Check it. Don't don't trust my judgment there. Um, but anyway, they're important for. Um, uh, when you have inflammation into tissues and stuff, this is where you're going to get a lot of fluid leaking out. Uh, the tunica intima in these vessels, it may only be one or two, uh, uh, I've got a mistake there, the tunica, let's put media, not intima, uh, the tunica intima is only one layer of endothelial cells. The tunica media may have one to two layers of smooth muscle, um, and then they have a very, very thin uh, tunica external external just or adventitia. That's just going to be a little connective tissue layer there. Um, these vessels are not active in vasoconstriction and vasodilation either. They're just trying to get that blood back to the heart. Well then when the venules coalesce to form larger vessels you call those veins. Um, and they have thinner walls, they have very little smooth muscle, and they have big large lumens. They're under low pressure. Um, they, they don't have that big force coming off the heart. And so these are low pressure vessels and like I said before, you've got to work to get that blood back up to the heart, especially in the lower extremities where you're fighting gravity as well. In these vessels, the tunica media is um, much thinner and the tunica externa is much thinner. So they're, they're just overall thinner vessels and so when you prepare them for slides, you'll see that they actually collapse because they don't have as much material holding them um, together. They are also called capacitance vessels, and capacitance is just a, a fancy word for storage. So you actually store a lot of your blood in the venous system. 65% of your blood supply is going to be found here, and they're rarely filled up. They're only partially filled. So the venous system is usually partially filled, but it does act as a storage reservoir for blood. Now, an interesting thing about veins is that they uh, contain what are called valves. Um, there's an exception to this. You don't have va uh, valves in the thoracic and abdominal cavity veins, but everywhere else, especially in the extremities, you're going to have vein, a valve. And what happens with a valve, they're designed to prevent backflow. So if this is our vessel here, um, and we're trying to get blood back up to the heart, so we'll draw a little heart right there, um, what happens is you have these flaps that just overlap. So as blood is pushing up through these flaps, they will open up and allow the blood to flow through. But once blood passes that flap, it, it'll, it'll reach another valve up here. And if for some reason it decides that it wants to come back down, whether it's due to gravity or you've just had your legs dangling and there's not you know, a whole lot of circulation going on, that blood will try to push back down. And when it hits that valve, it can't open it backwards. So that prevents backward flow. So what happens instead, it bounces off that valve and it gets pushed back up so on both directions. So the valves maintain that one-way flow and they prevent backflow so you don't want blood pooling. Well, unfortunately, the valves fail sometimes. And so if you have a leg that has a valve failing, what's going to happen 
because you're going to get your, your valve right here. And if this doesn't work, if this valve is faulty for some reason, reason, blood can actually flow back through that valve if it's leaky or if the flaps aren't covering or whatever. And then you start getting a pooling of blood here uh, down to where the next, uh, this bulging right here is going to cause pulsating, burning. Uh, you can feel every vet, uh, beat of your heart in them. Uh, it causes itching, skin irritation. It can cause skin discoloration. Um, they can cause ulcers. So you can get a lot of problems from having these bulging veins, which we call varicose veins. Let me write that out, varicose veins. So when the, the vein, when the valves are faulty, that causes these varicose veins, and then that causes all kinds of problems as well. Now, there are ways to treat these, um, but let, before we talk about that, let me just talk about some reasons why you might get this. Um, Dysfunctional valves could be due to pregnancy, like if, if a woman has repeated pregnancies uh, that's putting a lot of pressure on her abdominal vessels, which in turn causes pooling of blood in her legs, which breaks down those valves. Uh, people who are obese will have problems. There's a lot of genetic tendency towards uh, faulty veins. I was blessed with all three of those, obesity, pregnancies, and uh, genetic tendencies, so I had to have uh, treatment, and when I did it, um, the only treatment that was around for me was what was called vein stripping. So that's this right here. And this has been probably close to 20 years ago. But in a vein stripping, they completely remove, in my case, they remove the whole saphenous vein from the entire leg, from the ankle to the groin. Uh, sometimes if it's not quite as severe, they'll just take out segments that are damaged that have the little you know, vein damage there. But this treatment is kind of obsolete now because it's very painful, very traumatic. I mean, your leg turns black and blue and you're sore and um, it, it's, it's a really nasty thing. Um, now they have better treatments. They can use for smaller veins, which we call like spider veins, that just um, may, you might see little spidery purplish uh, vessels underneath the skin. They can use what we call sclerotherapy. Now sclerotherapy is for these mild varicosities, and um, basically what they do is they inject a sclerant or a sealer. So these kind of seal off the vessels, and basically when you seal off that vessel, you're closing that route, and so there's no blood flowing through it, so you're not going to have this bulging vein because there's nothing flowing through it. And you say, well, how can you just seal off these vessels or take them out? It doesn't that mess things up? No, you've always got collateral vessels that will pick up this blood flow and move it back towards the heart. So with sclerotherapy, you just inject a sclerant, and it may be something as simple as sodium chloride, a saline solution, and that will burn and fry these vessels and close them down. Um, it causes scarring, and that shuts them down, and usually it's an instantaneous kind of thing, and you do it in a dermatologist's office. Um, with the serious bulging vessels, like these are your spider veins, these little ones here, um, but when you have the big bulgy variscosities, you're going to have to do the uh, more invasive procedure. Um, the newest are these catheters and laser treatments where they insert a catheter, catheter, they run it up to the problem area, and then they will fry it with either radio frequencies or high heat that may go up to 700 degrees Celsius. And basically they're just boiling the vein, well that shuts it down closes it off, and then you no longer have any tr trouble with it. Radio frequency tends to have less um, collateral damage to uh, tissues surrounding it, and it seems to be a little bit uh, easier to deal with. But both of these procedures can be done under a local anesthetic in a dermatologist's office, so you don't have to go into to have this big major surgery to remove vessels anymore. All right, some other common disorders that you'll find in the vascular system are atherosclerosis. Now, don't confuse atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is when you have a buildup of a fatty plaque. So if there's a cross-section of your vessel, you're going to start getting a buildup of junk on the vessel, and sooner or later it's going to you know, keep collecting, and it will partially or even totally occlude that vessel, and so you're going to have problems. Um, with arteriosclerosis, this is more of a chronic problem where um, whether it's due to age, which most often it is, you get this chronic thickening and hardening of the arterial walls. So now they're starting to get so thick that they're actually decreasing the lumen diameter of that vessel. So
So now you've got this smaller lumen, so things are not going to flow through it as easily. And so um, you're going to start getting an increase in blood pressure, and you're going to get a decrease in blood flow to the areas beyond that. And another problem you might have is called an aneurysm. And this is where you get an or abnormal dilation of the vessel wall. So normally you would have a vessel wall that would look like that. Well, with an aneurysm, you start to get a weakness in the wall right here, whether it's in that muscular or the elastic layer of the tunica media. But what happens, instead of your wall looking like this, now you're going to start getting a ballooning where that weakness occurs. And so that ballooning right there is called the aneurysm. Now the danger of aneurysms, of course, are that they could possibly rupture. If this gets so weak, it could actually literally um, open up and then you could have some major bleeding here. Most commonly, you're going to find aneurysms in the aorta and uh, probably more common in the abdominal aorta. And these can be surgically corrected, um, but a lot of times it's obese people that are straining their bodies to begin with. And you may have to wait till that person loses weight to even get to a point where they can operate and try to help that person. Um, they also occur a lot in the uh, brain. And when you get a brain aneurysm and it ruptures, you're in major trouble. Then you get into what's known as a stroke. Um, so a stroke is actually a sudden rupture or of a vessel or the obstruction of a vessel. Now, if it's a ruptured vessel, you would call that a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, hemorrhagic, that's how I spell it, hemorrhagic. Anyway, hemorrhagic means it's a bleeding stroke. So you can have a stroke where you're actually bleeding, or you can have a stroke where you actually have an obstruction of the vessel, so things can't flow through. Um, you may have a blood clot that uh, gets loose and goes up to your brain and uh, occludes the vessels beyond that. Either way, it's not a good thing because what happens is if you're uh, obstructing or if you're just bleeding, you're going to not feed the tissue beyond where that obstruction is. Then, of course, with a hemorrhagic stroke or a ruptured aneurysm, you've got the problem of you've got this brain that's enclosed in a hard bony case and all of a sudden you're putting fluid into this case and so that's going to increase the pressure. Well, there's nowhere for this pressure to go because of that bony case so now you're going to start smooshing in and damaging brain tissue further. So that's why strokes can be very dangerous because your brain is just a, a tender piece of tissue and there's nowhere else for anything to go. Some other disorders uh, we need to talk about, first of all, would be hemorrhoids. And hemorrhoids are basically just a varicose vein of the butt. Um, basically, um, if, th they, if you have a lot of Training. If people are constipated a lot and pushing a lot, they will have hemorrhoids. Women who have babies, that pressure causes a lot of strain on the uh, veins of the rectum and the anus, and so that can cause them. Um, you can have hemorrhoids removed. That's a pretty invasive or serious surgery. It's painful, um, but the hemorrhoids themselves cause pain and itching too. So I don't know, you know, what's worse. Um, I was looking at some of the treatment options for uh, hemorrhoids and one of the things you can put topical ointments on. Probably everybody's heard of Preparation H. If you're in the Beauty Queen circuit, I know you've heard of Prefer Preparation H because it shrinks the swelling of the hemorrhoids and Beauty Queens will use it under their eyes to get the bags down for the pageants. Um, but they say it's really stinky, so I don't know. I've never used it. Um, one of the other preparations I found was him be gone. Uh, I thought that was a real catchy name, so I guess you just put it on and they go away. Um, another problem that you might run into is phlebitis, and phlebitis is, is just an inf inflammation or infection of a vein. So it may become red, tender, swollen, um, but you'll know if you've got phlebitis, it, it will um, announce itself. Any kind of inflammation usually does. One problem with this phlebitis, though, is you can lead into something known as thrombophlebitis. And so that's going to be an inf inflammation of a vein, but you also have a clot involved there. So it's the thrombus is what we call a stationary blood clot within a vessel. And this can, of course, damage the tissue beyond the clot. Um, it can be very painful. But the real danger is, is this going to clot, this thrombus, is stationary now, but what happens if it breaks off and moves around and goes up to your heart or your lungs or your brain? So
So when it does that, you get what's known as an embolus. So that's an abnormal particle, usually a blood clot, but it could be a gas bubble um, uh, or, or something else. But those will abnormally uh, break off and start circulating around, and then they get, have a tendency to lodge in some vital organ, and they can actually kill you. Um, you call this an embolism. When you have that sudden breaking of it, it, it's like, oh, she had a pulmonary embolism. That would mean you had a blood clot break off, go to the pulmonary region somewhere in your lungs, and cause a blood clot, and it can kill you. Um, so those are very dangerous. Um, you also have what's known as vascular anastomosis, um, and that's not necessarily a problem, but I just threw it, here in, uh, threw it in here at the end. Uh, this is where you have joining or coalescing or merging of blood vessels to provide alternate pathways for blood to reach a given area. So you would naturally think that you're going to have lots of anastomoses in like the brain, the kidney, and the heart, because if one area gets blocked off, you want to have some alternate routes for them to get the blood to get around that. So those are common there. Um, they're also common in like joints. Um, think about how, how like your knee joint, how many different movements you have in that and how it could pinch off different circulations. So you've got to have another way to get uh, blood flowing around those. So these will be common in joints. Um, I guess that's about all I have to say. If you want to prevent all the crappy stuff I was just talking about, remember, eat well and exercise. You can't go wrong doing either one of those. And I'm preaching to myself right now, but uh, that, that's real important. So that's all.